a total junkie for story. I read and write and live by them, and every couple years I write some down, and then I go city to city and read from my books. And over all these years, trafficking and story, I've noticed a little problem, which is that the standard pieces of good story, at least judging by what we teach, and also by what we reward most handsomely, can get in the way of reaching what I consider to be the Mount Everest of human emotions, which is to say the very hardest place to get to, but also where the views are sort of life-changing, which is acceptance. And by accept, I mean when we acknowledge the nature of the beast and the beast's nature. So another way to get at it is to look at the antonyms for accept, which are reject, spurn, deny, Another way to get at it is to talk about Temple Grandin, the famous gifted autistic woman who knew early on, as did everyone who ever met her, that her mind worked differently. And rather than deny or reject that or try to fix it, she said, this is how my mind works and I'm gonna work with what I've got. And as you probably know, she totally revolutionized the way we treat cattle in this country. So I posted, to get sort of real world on this, I posted on my Facebook page, what have you had to accept over your lifetime? and what happened after you accepted it. And in about 10 minutes, I got uh, a master's degree in higher order processing. My friends have had to accept multiple sclerosis, brain damage, stage four ovarian cancer, four types of addiction, losing a father to murder, a mother to suicide, everything to a fire, a son who has Rett syndrome, a daughter with diabetes, a son who wants to become a daughter, and all manner of assholes. <laughs> Boss, stepfather, ex. Here's a short list of things that we are all invited to accept over a lifetime. Our childhoods, which include the flaws of our mothers and fathers and the cruelties of the neighborhood kid and the prom date and the coach we thought had our back. Our children and their mysterious insecurities and tattoos and scars and lost potential and choice in mates our spouses and the many things they do differently from us, ourselves, the deadly sins, all seven of them, the weather, inconvenient or ruthless, and the irreversible trajectory of all human bodies. So clearly, acceptance, arduous though it is, is going to be required of us. Thankfully, acceptance gives back. In every single response on Facebook, the person said that once they actually crossed over, they set loose an internal freedom like they had never known, and that created a possibility for a qualitatively different kind of happiness and productivity. I got going on this whole acceptance thing about four or five years ago when I started working on this book, Glitter and Glue, which I thought was going to be about being a nanny, but it turned out to be about my mother, who liked to say, your father's the glitter, but I'm the glue. <laughs> My mother and I have virtually nothing in common. I am a dance on the table till midnight extrovert, a effusive, affectionate, second-guessing, self-doubting woman who likes nothing better than a long hug and a good cry. And my mother, do you watch Downton Abbey? <laughs> my mother's Maggie Smith. She is an old school, opinionated woman who likes nothing better than what she calls a party for one. Which sounds a lot more interesting than it is, I assure you. Um, it's when you pour a nice glass of Chardonnay over ice and you take off your bra and you grab your library book and go somewhere no one can find you. Now, I have a lot of stories about my mom and I've been telling them my whole life. Like, for instance, she's a chronic regifter. And by regifting, she takes it to a whole new level, which is to say, if you were to give her anything, like the bag of goodies I got upon arrival, she would open them very gingerly, and then she would write in pencil on the bottom what it was, and then she would take it home and put it in her closet, her gift closet, and then right before Christmas, she sets up what she calls the store, which is in the upstairs bedroom that's empty, she lays out all the things she's been given over the course of the year, the lotions and the candles and the strange scarves, and then she puts a little price tag on them and she sells them to her children. <laughs> so that we can give them to our aunts and uncles and godparents who we've forgotten to buy a gift for. <laughs> 
And I asked her if she minded me telling you that, and she said, Betty Moran told me regifting is green. <laughs> but strangely, in the process of thinking her through, it takes years to write a book, there's so many rewrites and conversations, I finally stopped trying to change her, to make her more liberal, or spendy, or outgoing, or even to just get her to switch from Folgers coffee crystals to brewed coffee. I understood for the first time that her way of being in the world is the right way for her. And sometimes, when I'm accepting her, it spills over into my ability to embrace the reality of my own children, and even occasionally, my husband. Though not when he packs the dishwasher, because in that case, he does it wrong. <laughs> like Mount Everest, acceptance is a really hard place to stay. The air is thin, and I find that I keep falling back into the fight for things to conform to how they should and should not be. And I think those expectations are established by the conscious and subconscious and sometimes totally unconscious pull to narrative its glorious arcs, and its promising, reassuring internal logics that, like it or not, life refuses to replicate. So if you think about it, we learn in elementary school, and then again in middle school, and again in high school, to look for the five-part dramatic structure that's underneath all the stories we're consuming. Exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, best of all, denouement, which is a French word that means untie, but my daughter's teacher defined it as the catharsis following a return to normality. Doesn't that sound fabulous? <laughs> then we graduate into the world and we consume and, and produce all kinds of content, literary and cinematic and lyrical, and the world says, you want a winning story? Give me a character I can root for, take him on a journey, and give me a resolution. This goes way back, of course, to Homer and Shakespeare, where certain appetites were created or maybe just reinforced. For instance, the heroes we love to love are the reluctant nominees like Odysseus. The villains we love to hate are the unseemly power grabbers like Lady Macbeth, which is fine for fiction. The problem is when we start wanting and even expecting real regular people to behave like the archetypal characters we know from our favorite stories. So for a tiny example of narrative's influence, in politics, the reluctant hero thing goes, if you really want me to run, I will. <laughs> Nobody ever says I've wanted to be president since I was in kindergarten. <laughs> in my world, the world of writing, it goes, I didn't hunt down an agent or corner the editor at the party. I was discovered. <laughs> we lean toward stories of destiny an organic rise confers authenticity, and that is established or reinforced or some unholy cycle of the two by story. And that might be making it harder to accept partners and candidates and colleagues who are staying in this tiny case, a complex mix of ambition and good luck. Speaking of spurning complexity, I was watching cable news in the airport and there were stories about Hillary Clinton and the doctor who performed Joan Rivers' last procedure, and of course, Roger Goodell. Depending on what channel you watch, they're idiots or prodigies, schemers or innocents. Nobody, it seems, can resist the pull to narrative, and that's making for a whole lot of anger and intolerance. This isn't much different, of course, than the leaders of startups, who continually edit their narrative until it seems like one predestined step after another. It's all totally understandable. But these sorts of legendary rises can be fatally dangerous to fledgling inventors and entrepreneurs who were planning to get to the Holy Land by surface streets instead of rocket ships. Speaking of fatally discouraging, every high school kid I know has bought into this powerful myth. Hero works hard, hero goes to Yale, hero has great life which leaves the community college kids and the kids who worked very hard but got rejected anyway, agonizing over the unthinkable fate that awaits them. And God help the heroes who went to Yale and are not having a great life. Most dangerously, though, 
Spontaneous narrative structuring happens, and it happens all the time between friends. Journalists talk about this thing, it's a tension between truth-telling and something they refer broadly, refer to broadly as civic uplift which is sort of shaping the story to give the public what the public needs, especially during times of crisis. I think we might all be participating in casual civic uplifting. It's hyper apparent now, as we all become micro media, media outlets on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, presenting thin slice versions of our lives, mastering the art of the interpersonal headline. It's harmless. Or maybe this is why teen depression and anxiety are at record levels, because their lives are publicly and quantitatively less populated and eventful than at Jenny Gogos and Ryan and his 764 Instagram friends who follow him everywhere. Where long form, nuanced interaction is concerned, we're so out of practice we almost don't know how. I was recently in a room of adults and a kid was behind us on the floor making this crazy collage that made no sense. And while some of us were sort of awkwardly struggling to get a conversation going with her, her basketball playing brother came home and everyone spun around and said, did you win? What was the score? The team lost, it turned out, because the refs were blind and voila, we had a villain. Here was a plot we all knew how to discuss. All the while, the arty kid noodled on the floor behind us with her amorphous project that nobody knew how to talk about. Speaking of things people don't know how to talk about, I had cancer in my 30s. It was kind of stunning how many conversations that year included, was it in your family, you're so brave, and what a wake-up call. I totally appreciate that it is unbearable for bad things to just happen unbidden. I feel the same way all the time. But the truth is that after every one of those conversations, I felt a little heavy hearted, like I couldn't give them the civic uplift they were asking for. I don't have the genetic predisposition, which would have been a nice first chapter of my story. There's not one heroic thing about me. And though it would have been nice to claim that cancer reprioritized my life, I didn't need a wake up call. I already knew that I was lucky. We do this for a lot of reasons, besides the biggie, which is our kind of oldest time caveman craving for order and reason. One reason is to establish consistency. So we want to feel integrated across the stages and compartments of our lives. I call it the interview effect or the first date effect, which is when your job as class secretary in 10th grade led to your organizational development degree at Stanford, which led to consulting for the Fortune 500, which led to the creation of your firm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, look at the pain that's caused by perceived inconsistencies like gay Christians or libertarian artists or philanthropic dopers. Another reason we do it is to suspend reality. I mean, who really wants to face an impending financial reckoning or deal with a souring marriage? Who wants to say their candidate blew it or that some problems cannot be straightened out just by cleaning house? And sometimes we artificially flavor as a means to invention. So we articulate this vision using all the heartening beats of narrative. And it's an essential step in creating something new. We tell our investors and our job candidates and our early adopters the story of how our essential whatever emerged organically from a latent need only we could see. But the simplified narratives that we're creating and projecting and consuming tempt us into forgetting that family, more than the milestone birthdays, is a dicey damn business. And marriage has hardly a thing to do with anniversary dinners. Products often fail, and policies usually come up short one way or another. All the photoshopping, literally and metaphorically, is leaving us feeling ripped off when our heroes have colossal blind spots, when our most important relationships go in circles, and when catharsis followed by a return to normalcy is nowhere to be found. I do know a few people who seem to live with a kind of radical honesty, who rarely negate or reject that which makes them uncomfortable. One is my cousin Kathy, who lost her 19-year-old, the great but not perfect Aaron Zentgraft, in a car accident. 
She told me once that for many years she asked herself, why did this happen? And she finally figured it out. It happened because it can. Cars can flip, glass can break, metal can pierce. Seeing that clearly, accepting the unadulterated reality, set her free. So here's a few things that we can do. Check in daily with complex content. Long form journaliz journalism, I still love The New Yorker, but I'm also reading every day on medium.com. Literary fiction, HBO, have you seen The Leftovers? Yeah, my one person, but that's really, con <laughs> that is really complex storytelling. Uh, to be on guard for the cognitive moment when people become characters, when a series of events becomes a plot, when endings become tidy. I know that I'm tacking on a denouement when I hear myself invoke destiny with lines like, I could have told you from day one, <laughs> and absolutisms like always, only, everyone. Catharsis is created, not found which means all resolutions, and this is such great news, are of our making. And maybe our best defense against narrative creep and the unnecessary and sometimes even crippling dissatisfaction it can generate is to keep at least one confidant on all matters, a real friend with whom we trade the unadorned truths of our lives, non-conforming, inconsistent, notably deficient in many areas. That's the shared reality we're being asked to accept, and that's the mountain I hope to summit before it's all over. Maybe I'll see you there.